always a privilege to introduce our speaker, especially this one. Um, Tom Baker is with us today, and I am always excited to hear Tom speak. Tom has spent his entire life in service to people like you and me. Um, coming from his roots of a young child and a Catholic background and becoming a Catholic priest to spreading his wings, as I call it, and reaching out beyond that and touching the ARE community, touching our community here at the Fellowship of the Inner Light. Um, Tom brings with him a wonderful, wonderful sense of humor. He brings with him a sense of beauty and inner love that he shares with us. His message is always potent. His message is always on target. And I'm looking forward to hearing you speak, Tom. Please come forward. Let's see. Let me see what we got in the last day. Water. <laughs> yes. Well, you and I are very, very lucky. We believe in a God that's different in some ways than most Christian people believe in. We believe in a life that's different. I'm aware of how many Christian people think about God from the days that I was a priest and teaching preaching. Every Sunday for about a year, I went around to all kinds of churches and listened to Sunday sermons. These were mainline churches like Protestant, uh, Presbyterian, Methodist, Catholic churches, Evangelical churches, Bible-based churches, Church of God, uh, Independent Baptist churches, Church of God, Church of God, that's how they said it. Um, Southern Baptist, Episcopal churches, all kinds of churches. And the sermons were very similar. The major theme was, what would Jesus do? And more often challenging, what are you doing for Jesus? One sermon challenged the congregation with the question, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? <laughs> that starts you thinking, doesn't it? Yes. Now that's, as you can tell, there's much more challenge than there is nurture. The present day Jesus was depicted as disappointed, sad, impatient, on his last nerve, about to blow a gasket, ashamed of us, wringing his wounded hands, shaking his head crowned with the thorns of our sins. He had died for us, and daily we let him down. What were we going to do? What were we going to do about it? And you're left feeling, I'm not doing enough for Jesus. How can I do more? In other words, you're left feeling guilty. Now, you do not hear sermons like this in this church. The emphasis in the New Thought Movement, sometimes the New Age Movement, is on seeing and thinking with Jesus, having a Christ consciousness. Edgar Cayce said that the Christ consciousness was the flow of life consequent upon the realization of our divine identity. No one in those other churches ever said anything about us being God. Or us being in God, or God being in us. God was always sort of out there watching. I'll be watching you every move you make, every fire, whatever. <laughs> every 
smile, you fake. That, that's what it was. <laughs> Here, Jesus is our elder brother. He shows us not what to do to please him or God, but who we actually are. Jesus is the portrait of the human being to be. Jesus is the ideal. The crucified Jesus is how we see ourselves. Victimized, suffering, unfairly treated. The resurrected Jesus is the picture of how God sees us. Loving, vibrant, strong, wise. Remember the first time I took Kathy to my church, she looked, there was a huge crucifix in the middle of the, in the front of the church. And she looked up at that crucifix and she said, why do they have a dead person in your church? I said, Kathy, that's not a dead person. That's Jesus. She says, well, Jesus is alive. That's not the person I know. That's a dead person up there. In the church sermons, there was often the warning that there wasn't much time left. <laughs> Judgment Day was on its way. I began to call this deadline theology. <laughs> Life was a grim test that most of us were flunking and time was running out. I found out, I found out the church made me a little nervous and gave me a mild headache. <laughs> it was such a relief to come to the fellowship and the ARE and learn that life is a series of challenges where we learn to love under pressure. A lot of pressure. <laughs> We're living in a schoolroom, but we have lots of chances. Peter asked Jesus one time how often he was supposed to forgive. It says in the scriptures, forgive seven times. Jesus told Peter, forgive, forgive 70 times, seven times. And I've often thought that that, that was his way of saying you have lots and lots of chances. You have lots and lots of lifetimes. Maybe that's how many lifetimes we have. Seven times 70. That's how many chances we've got. Life is a kind of test of our divine will to love under many circumstances in the face of endless appearances that are false. As a priest, and now as a therapist, I meet people in compromising situations who often appear at their worst. And I ask the question, can I be them? I used to tell people who were suffering that they were lucky to be learning such deep spiritual lessons. <laughs> <laughs> if they weren't in so much pain, they would have done just that. <laughs> they would have laughed at me. <laughs> but what a couple of them did was they'd say, Well, Father, <clears throat> would you trade places with me? That challenge became my standard of love. Could I, would I see the world through their eyes, journey through life in their bodies, think with their brains, feel with their hearts. I realized that's actually what happens. That's what reincarnation does. We become the ones we despised or ignored in the next life. We find ourselves in situations that we created for others, both good and bad. How we treat other people, how we treat situations, lays the groundwork for our next life. So we are constantly, in a big picture way, becoming everybody else. So why not 
love everybody else completely now. Why not look at people and say, I could be you. I could do it. I could live your life. Now that's not only love, that's trust. The best servants that I ever heard were in the black churches. These sermons were often performances with lots of audience participation in the forms of Amen and Hallelujah. The congregation actually encouraged the minister. Instead of sitting back like this and going, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was Amen, brother. Hallelujah, friend. Now my introverted white boy over-controlled temperament trembled a little at first, but soon I was joining in with the rest. One theme in black preaching is Jesus with you, Jesus beside you, Jesus on the other end of the phone line. There's lots of joy and there's high energy, singing, swaying, all the way into the afternoon. I have to set aside the whole day to go to a black church. So I learned from black preaching that I was not alone that I was accompanied by a joyful and soulful brother, Jesus, who would help me through anything. That's the black message. It's a great message. And finally, after I left the priesthood and I got married, there was the preaching of my wife. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> As a preaching teacher, I had learned that we all have a sermon within us that we preach. By the words we speak to others, our attitudes, our actions towards people. It's almost a never, never, it's almost never a formal talk like this, but it's a real sermon. Sometimes it's challenging. <laughs> Sometimes it's nurturing, but it has a definite message. My wife's message has been unfailingly positive. It is her preaching that has taught me the secret of love between two people in families, among friends, and the secret is this. Never make the person you love feel bad about themselves. Never make the person you love feel bad about themselves. Now our egos will always try to find the bad, the error, the wrong, and the other, so we can make the other one feel guilty. The ego loves guilt like a bear loves honey. I've heard it from the pulpit, and I hear it daily in marriage counseling. Sinner, bastard, loser. Instead, as my wife has told me in so many ways, I behold innocence in you. When I look out at you, at the fellowship, when I think of those people in the churches, in my clients, in my wife, and of course, in you, my great friend, Jesus. I behold the innocence in you. That, I think, is the sermon, the sermon that we're all meant to preach. Now, in a lot of those churches I went to, there was an altar call. We don't have an altar call here. Thank goodness. <laughs> At the altar call, you were to be saved from God's wrath. Now, I would invite you to do an altar call in your own mind. Not to be saved from God's wrath, but from your own wrath. We are so mean to ourselves. We forget that we are all the sons and daughters of the living God of living love. We have enormous dignity. 
We have enormous majesty. We are kings and queens, so often begging for a scrap of positivity. It doesn't have to be. We can step forward and we can say, I accept my majesty. I accept my grandeur. I am the royal son or daughter of the living God.